have an opportunity to learn what babies tell us. And we're in fantastic hands because Professor Paul Broom, a much sought, off, much sought after speaker, is going to tell us about babies. So why don't you help me welcome him to the podium and he'll be presenting his work to us. Thank you. Thank you. Can people hear me? Yes. Good. Um, my name is, uh, is Paul Bloom. I'm a professor in the Yale Psychology Department. Uh, this may be a bit of an unusual science Saturday. I'm not here to talk about physics or chemistry or biology. I'm here to talk about the science of the human mind. And I am um, actually want to talk about a specific problem that's long interested me. And that has to do with human kindness. The question is, where does human kindness, human niceness come from? And I'll start with a, a story that the anthropologist Sarah Hurdy tells in her great book, Mothers and Others. So Hurdy describes being on an airplane. And she's not flying business class. She's not flying first class. She's flying coach. She's crammed in with a lot of people. She's sitting squeezed in with people. You know. Um, Food, she's already been through security, so somebody touched her and they saw her naked and everything. And, and food's being pushed through the carts and she's not getting it. And then somewhere she hears a baby crying. And she sees other people and are kind of rolling their eyes. And to make the time go by a bit better, because she also studies chimpanzees, she asked a question. She says, I cannot keep from wondering what would happen if my fellow human passengers suddenly morphed into another species of ape. What if I were traveling for a plane load of chimpanzees? Any one of us would be lucky to disembark with all ten fingers and toes still attached, with the baby still breathing and unmaimed. Bloody earlobes and other appendages would litter the aisles, compressing so many highly impulsive strangers into a tight space would be a recipe for mayhem. How many people here have ever flown on a long flight? How many people here on the flight when a plane landed, there were body parts on the floor? <laughs> Humans, you know, I no doubt this happened once or twice, but billions of people fly each year, and somehow we manage to keep from killing each other. And that's kind of a puzzle as a psychologist. What makes this different? In general, people are nice. And this shows up in all sorts of ways. So um, we give to charity. Americans give billions of dollars each year to charity. Now, some people who are cynical point out that some of the charities we might give to help ourselves. We might give money to a museum that we like to go to. Or we might give money to a university that we, might not want, we want our children to go to. But some of the charity we give to people in faraway lands. Um, some of us here gave to the people who uh, suffered from the disasters in Haiti or in Japan. These are people who we might not know, who can do nothing for us, who will never know that it was us who helped, yet still we are motivated to help. Um, we leave tips. We leave tips in restaurants. Now, if you went to the restaurant over and over again, you might leave a tip because you want better service next time. But we leave tips in restaurants we're never going to go back to. We give money to strangers. Um, and in fact, in general, we help strangers. My favorite experiment on this was done by Stanley Milgram at Yale University. So Stanley Milgram um, was very famous for an experiment on human cruelty, where he got people to um, believe that they shocked one another. And he found that even under some circumstances, people would do terrible things to each other. But he was also interested in niceness. He did a very, very clever study. He had envelopes with stamps on them and an address. And this was an address of a house he, he had. And what he did was very simple. He took these steel envelopes with stamps, and he walked through the streets of New Haven, and he put them places. He put it on a ledge. He dropped it under a lamppost. He stuck it in a branch of a tree. And the question was very simple. How many of these would be sent? And the answer was amazing. About 80% of them were sent. People picked up an envelope, looked at it, saw it had a stamp on it, and they put it in a mailbox and sent it out. Now, maybe you could argue that it's just maybe uh, government employees or something doing it automatically, but then he did something clever. He found that they would only send this out if they believed, if they didn't think the letter was going to a bad person. So what he did was he did the study again, but this time instead of somebody's name on the envelope, Joe Smith, he wrote 
friends of the Nazi party. In that case, none of the envelopes went back to it. People must have ripped it up or threw it in the government. We said, oh my gosh, friends of the Nazi party, I'll put it in the post. Um, somebody recently replicated this in New York City. And this time, they didn't put stamps on the envelopes. They just had envelopes without stamps. Still, about a quarter of them came back. I can't even stamp my own envelopes. Yet there are people around who find, oh my goodness, I'll go home, I'll put a stamp on it and send it back. That's kind of a puzzle. And so as a psychologist, I'm interested in where our niceness comes from. Now, there are a lot of ways you could ask this question. You could ask it as an evolutionary question. Um, our species has evolved through history. What happened in our evolution to make us nice? You could ask this from the standpoint of a society or a culture. What happened to Americans or Africans or Asians or whatever that made their society nice? But I'm a developmental psychologist, and I want to answer it from the perspective of children. I want to look at the question of, of where does niceness come within every one of us? To put it a bit differently, we were all babies once. How, many of us, I think everybody in this room has some of the niceness I'm talking about. Where did it come from in our development? Were we born this way? Now, many people believe the answer is no. Many people, scientists and philosophers and, and religious people, believe we have no natural niceness. Um, this is nicely expressed in a headline in a magazine, The Onion. Anybody here read The Onion? The Onion is not a real magazine. It's a satire. So, um, so but the headline here is, new study <laughs> reveals most children unrepentant sociopaths, which means that most children are sort of, you know, like psychopathic killers and everything. Now, it was a joke headline, but it captures what many people think, which is those of you who are children or those of you who have children may be familiar with the idea that children are monsters. Um, no offense to anybody. Uh, but um, as they say, uh, uh, callous monsters who would remorselessly exploit them to, exploit, to, to obtain something as insignificant as an ice cream cone or a new toy. Um, <laughs> but I don't think that that's right. I think there's a better view of human nature. And this was actually expressed by Thomas Jefferson. Um, so Jefferson wrote many years ago, the moral sense or conscience is as much a part of man as his leg or arm. It is given to all human beings in a stronger or weaker degree, as force of members is given them in a greater or lesser degree. The language is a bit archaic, but what he means here is um, we have a moral sense, a sense of right and wrong, the same way we have arms and legs. Now, it's true that some people might have muscular, strong arms and legs, and others might have weak arms and legs, just like some of us might have a highly developed moral sense and others a weaker moral sense, but we all have it. And as an example of this, so Jefferson wrote this in America, of course, but thousands of miles away at the same time, Adam Smith, the great philosopher Adam Smith, thought about this. He wrote, he gave an example of what we all have. He says, when we see a stroke aimed and just ready to fall upon the leg or arm of another person, we naturally shrink and draw back our own leg or arm. And when it does fall, we feel it in some measure and are hurt by it as well as to suffer. And what he means is that when we see somebody else in pain, it hurts us. Here's a picture which I think nicely illustrates this. Um, now, now, he is not in any real pain himself, but he's, he's tensing up in anticipated pain, and he feels it. Um, if you ever watch a movie where somebody is being beaten, or somebody falls down, or somebody is being kicked in the wrong place, you might go, oh! tensing up an empathetic response. And this might be the foundation of morality, some hardwired caring for others. So we know it's true for children. One way to make a baby cry is to expose it to other crying babies. Now, psychologists are a very, very cynical bunch. And so when this finding first came out, they said, that doesn't mean anything. Babies are really stupid, and they're so stupid that when they hear crying, they think, I must be crying. And they get upset, and they cry some more. <laughs> so then, very clever psychologists did another experiment where they played babies tape-recorded sounds of their own crying, 
versus tape recorded sounds of other babies crying, and found that they cry more for other babies than for themselves, suggesting that it really has to do with other people. We know that some sort of kindness as expressed in sharing and helping is universal. Humans everywhere will often share, even share food with those close to them, like their brothers and sisters, like their close friends. Recently, people have studied this in the laboratory. So in a very nice study by uh, Felix Varnikin and Michael Tomasello, they put toddlers in a situation where an adult was in some sort of trouble. And they wanted to see if the toddler would help the adult, even if nobody was prompting him. And I'll show you a short video from one of their studies that illustrates this. Now, at Yale University, I've been involved with experiments with young babies, looking now not really at how they behave when they see another person in pain, and not really looking at whether they help others, but looking at their understanding of right and wrong. And this is work I've done in collaboration with my, my colleague and my wife, Karen Wynn, who runs the Yale Infant uh, Laboratory here. And we study, we study babies in her laboratory. And the first studies we did were looking at how babies make, predict the actions of other individuals. So this was done with, uh, with Valerie Kuhlmeier. And I'll show you what babies saw. So I'm gonna, for a second, I wanna, in a second, I'm going to ask you to imagine that you're a baby watching something. But what, baby, but what we did was we had a case where somebody is being helped by one character and hindered, roughed up by another character. And the question we were interested in is, what would babies expect that guy to do? Would they expect him to go to the one that helped him or the one that hindered him? Now, for adults, that's a no-brainer. You go to the one that helps you, not the one that hurts you. But we wanted to see if kids had the same belief. And the way we tested this, because you can't ask a 9-month-old or 12-month-old, they can't talk. But, they, but you could tell what they expect or what surprises them by where they look and how long they look at something. So I'll show you. Imagine yourself as a baby, and this is what you see in one of our studies. And then, the question, then we would show you different videos. We'd show you a video like this. in a video like this. And if you were a baby, what you would probably do is you would do what you, do, you find in our experiment. For both 9-month-olds and 12-month-olds, they would look longer when the character approached the one that hindered it than the one that helped it. And for a baby, babies look longer at scenes that surprise them, that don't make any sense to them. So that was our first set of studies. But then we decided, and this was in collaboration with this brilliant graduate student we got, Kylie Hamlin, to ask a simpler question. So forget about what babies predict about other characters. What do babies themselves think of these guys? So what we did was we gave up on fancy movies. What if they're real blocks, real shapes? And what if they saw this and they could touch them? What would they do? So again, imagine yourself a baby. And actually, you'll see now a picture the camera's going to show both what the baby sees and another level, the baby, uh, him or herself.
So then we wanted to see which one the baby liked more, the good guy or the bad guy. Now again, you can't ask a baby. But there, to determine which one the baby likes more, you could get the baby to choose. And before I tell you the results of this experiment, I want to tell you a little bit about the methods we use to test babies. Because some of you might wonder here, how do we know the baby is choosing the one that's the good guy or bad guy? Maybe the baby chooses, likes a certain color or a certain shape. And the way we figure that out experimentally is we do something, the word is counterbalancing, but what this basically means is we make sure that half the time the good guy is blue and half the time the bad guy is blue. We make sure half the time the good guys are square and half the time the bad guys are square. And that way we know that if babies have a difference, they can't be doing it on the basis of color and shape. Some of you may be wondering about something else. How do we know the mother who's holding the baby isn't cueing the baby somehow? Or the person who's holding up the choice isn't cueing the baby somehow? And the way we get our, not, not even like, not because they're trying to fake the, the experiment or cheat, but because unconsciously, you know, they might do it. And the way we do it is, and here's another experimental word, blind, um, they don't know themselves what the right answer is. So the person offering the baby the choice didn't get to see what the baby saw. So she doesn't even know what the right answer is. She couldn't cue even if she wanted to. This is an example of a baby making a choice, just so you can see what it looks like. And these are our results. For both 10-month-olds and 6-month-olds, they would tend overwhelmingly to reach for the good guy than the bad guy. Um, this was published in the journal Nature a couple of years ago. And I think for any of these papers, I'm going pretty quickly through them, giving you a general sense. But, but uh, you could always email me. My email is paul.bloom at yale.edu. I will answer any questions about this. And I will also send you any of the papers for the details. Um, we also want to test three-month-olds. Now, three-month-olds are, as some of you know, they're meatloafs. They're lumps. They can't even reach. But they could do one thing. They can look. And we knew from other studies that babies tend to look at the one they like. So we redid the study. This time, we didn't ask them to reach. We just held up these guys, and we saw which one they looked at longer. And we found they looked at the good guy, what we call a pro-social guy, longer than the antisocial guy. Now, the experiments I've told you so far involve this helping up a hill and pushing down a hill. And some of you might be thinking, because we worried about this too, maybe there's something strange about that. Maybe you don't want to do, you don't want to do all your research using one design. So we, we began a few years ago to do different good guy, bad guy scenarios. And I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I'll give you one example of a study we did. I won't tell you even the results, because it worked out, but I won't give you the details. But I want you to look at these videos, and I want you to guess yourself. Imagine yourself being a baby. Who do you think the good guy is, and who do you think the bad guy is? And I'll show you two videos, one after the other. Um, I think your intuition is probably the same as mine. And we found in our studies, the babies had the same intuition. I won't show you data, but I'll show you what I find is a very cute film of a baby making a choice. Now. Some of, you, um, some of you may wonder, well, this is all sort of choosing a good guy versus a bad guy. And we're doing this because we're interested in the origin of kindness, the origin of morality. But there's more to morality than choices. And we are trying to explore the question of, to what extent is what babies are doing similar to what adults are doing when you judge somebody as good and bad? 
And we, we began to be interested in one thing, which is, for an adult, if I think what you're doing is a good thing, in a moral sense, what I'm more likely to do is reward you, to give you something. That doesn't, you don't just give people something for no reason, but, but that's what you do for good things. On the other hand, if I think that something is, you're doing is an immoral thing, a bad thing, not just something I don't like, but immoral, I'm more likely to punish you. Reward and punishment connect up with morality, at least for adults. So we wanted to see if this is true for babies. So here we tested older babies. These are 19-month-olds, because it's more complicated. And what we did was we showed them the same good guy, bad guy characters I just told you about. And the question was, um, they were, now they just didn't give a choice. They had to choose whether to reward a character in one study, to give a treat, or to punish a character, to take away a treat. And here are the results. When the character, when the question was, who do you reward, they tended to reward the pro-social guy. That's a fancy word meaning the good guy. But when the question was, who do you punish, they tend to punish the anti-social guy, the bad guy. I'll show you a little clip, which is my favorite baby clip that I've ever seen. And I will warn you, I'll be honest, most babies didn't do this. But this was in a punishment experiment. So what just happened was a baby took away one from the bad guy, and then he did something else. He, he whacked him. <laughs> I think these experiments suggest that there's a sense of natural niceness to us. What we find in babies is some sort of care for others, some ability to do moral evaluation, to judge right and wrong, and some sense of justice. Um, I think that when it comes to adults, at least, this niceness isn't just a sort of burden we suffer through, but a source of pleasure. So I'm going to do something absolutely terrible right now, and I'm going to mention I have a book that I just published. You can get it at Amazon for a significant discount. Um, <laughs> Uh, called How Pleasure Works, which is about the pleasure of everyday life. And one argument I make in the book is that kindness, morality, is a great source of pleasure. I'll tell you this, and I'll give you two arguments for this. One argument is, if you ask people how their lives are doing, um, how happy they are, how rich their lives are, and then you ask them, how much do you give to charity, and how much do you volunteer, the answers are very tightly related. The, the technical term for that is they're correlated. And that means they go together. Find me somebody who's very happy. I bet that person gives a lot to charity and volunteers. Find me somebody who's very sad. I bet the person doesn't. Now, there are exceptions. And one can be very critical about which way it goes. Maybe um, volunteering makes you happy. Or maybe being happy makes you more likely to volunteer. But there definitely is a connection. A second bit of evidence is from laboratory studies. So it turns out that studies of what makes people happy, sometimes indicated by brain scans, find that one of the best things you could do with $10, from a selfish point of view, if you only care about your own happiness, is to give it away. The act of giving away something to somebody who you perceive as needy is a great boost in happiness. We are naturally nice, and that's sort of the first main part of my talk. But now I want to turn a little bit and make and kind of get a little bit more cynical. We're naturally nice to those around us, but how do we instinctively respond to strangers? How do we instinctively respond to people who aren't part of our group? And the answer, I think, is with fear, hatred, and disgust. <laughs> so um, we see this in babies. Um, when babies are about nine months of age, and they encounter a stranger, they feel a lot of anxiety. Psychologists who are very, very clever have used a wonderful term to describe this called stranger anxiety. Um, and, and now, you could say, well, that's babies. But it turns out that most humans in small-scale societies, so I'm not talking about a big society composed of millions of people like we live in here, but a smaller community like where, where most humans used to, used to live, in the situations where we've evolved, you find a similar response to strangers. I'll give you two, two uh, quotes that support this. One is by the anthropologist Jared Diamond. And he's talking about small groups in Papua New Guinea. And he writes, to venture out of one's territory to meet other humans, even if they lived only a few miles away, was equivalent to suicide. Margaret Mead is one of the world's most famous anthropologists. 
And she was famously a defender of what was then called primitive societies. She would, um, she would argue that we, um, that we should actually live our own lives more like those in primitive societies. But she was also very honest about how these people dealt with strangers. And she wrote, most primitive tribes feel that if you run across one of those subhumans from a rival group in a forest, the most appropriate thing to do is bludgeon him to death. I'll finally say something brief about disgust. So disgust is um, a human universal. It, is, um, it has a facial, a basic fa uh, characteristic, sorry, a basic facial expression when you're disgusted. You go, ooh. And we are mostly disgusted everywhere by animals and animal byproducts. What I mean by, I want to give you a list of things. And I bet people will find everything on the list gross. Imagine it dumped on your, on your lap. Feces, urine, blood, vomit, rotten flesh, and most meat are disgusting. Um, meat is interesting. People are perfectly comfortable eating the meat in which they are raised. How many people would be comfortable eating a hamburger? Are people willing to eat hamburger? OK, what about dog? Rat? OK, you put down your hand over there. Rat? Good rat. Human? There we go. Um, and so you wonder, well, why am I telling you this? What does this have to do with, um, with morality? Well, it turns out that many of us instinctively can find strange people disgusting. Anybody know who he is? Darwin, excellent. Um, Charles Darwin, the discoverer of evolution, was a wonderful observer of human nature. And he, he wrote, um, he described very honestly feelings of disgust towards other people. So here's a famous uh, quote. In Tierra del Fuego, a native touched with his finger some cold preserved meat and plainly showed disgust at its softness, whilst I felt utter disgust at my food being touched by a naked savage, though his hands did not appear dirty. And in my own research, um, I'm actually, for the, for the meaning of time, I'm going to skip past a little bit. But um, in my own research, I found that disgust can, um, differences in how you experience disgust can affect how you react to other people. So I'll tell you about two studies. Um, one study is you can get people to, um, people differ in how easily disgusted they are. How many people would be really, and, and so there are scales that measure how easily disgusted you are. I'll give you a scale. How many people, I'm a, here's an example. You have to pick up a dead cat with your hands. How many people here would be really grossed out by that? How many people not so grossed out? That's a difference. Here's another one. And this one seems, here's one that might seem really minor. You go onto a city bus, and you sit down, and a seat's still warm from the last person on it. How many of you would be really disgusted by that? Yes, how many people say, what? I'm not disgusted at all. That's another difference. It turns out, now, this is, a, this is not a huge relationship. And those of you who are easily disgusted shouldn't get worried about this. But it turns out how easily disgusted you are is related to your negative attitudes about other people, like uh, uh, gay men and gay women and immigrants, people from other lands. People who are more easily disgusted show a tendency to be more hostile to others. Um, we also find this in the laboratory. So there's a lot of experiments by the University of Virginia psychologist Jonathan Haidt, and then some work I've done with my colleagues. I'll tell you about this study. It's the weirdest study I've ever done. You're going to, OK. You bring people into the lab. And there's two groups of people. So one group of people, you bring them into the lab, and they sit down at a table. And you tell them, we want to get your moral judgments about right and wrong about all sorts of people. What do you think of this kind of person? What do you think of that kind of person? And then you get their data, and that's it. The second group, you tell them to go in the room and answer the same questions. But before they go in the room, we spray the room with a fart spray. This is the only study I've ever done that has a fart spray in it. So you spray the room with a fart spray. So people go in and go, oh, this isn't, nice. this isn't a good room. And, and, okay, and then you ask them for their moral judgments. Now, what difference should, should it make from a logical point of view how smelly the room is? But it does make a difference. 
Being grossed out makes you mean, and it makes you more morally disapproving of other groups. We are not naturally nice to strangers. I think our kindness is triggered by people around us, by our family, by our friends. But I think when dealing with somebody we know it to be a stranger, it changes us a bit. But that sets up a puzzle. And this puzzle has been pointed out by a lot of very wise philosophers and psychologists like Robert Wright and uh, Peter Singer and Steven Pinker, that we've gotten better. So we started off as a species with a very narrow niceness, but we've gotten better. Um, this is, um, I'm sorry, this scale didn't show up here. But this is a, a scale of the death rate from warfare, the number of people who die at the hands of another, scaled over time, where this is the 20th century, and then you go back through time. And here's the thing to note about this. Um, yes? Good question. Each of these bars is the proportion of humanity. So, and so, one way of looking at this is, you could say in the, many people say that the last century was the bloodiest century. It was a horribly bloody, vile and terrible century. And when you add up all the numbers of people who died in World War I and World War II, you find a lot of humanity would died at the hands of, another, of others. It was absolutely horrific, the 20th century. The only thing worse than the 20th century was the 19th century, which was really bad. The only thing worse than the 19th century was the 18th century. And it turns out that, that if you are born now, as a human now, your odds of getting killed by another person um, are far less than if you were born 1,000 years ago, and far, far less than if you were a hunter-gatherer in, in a small society. And this is an objective sense in which humans have gotten better. Then there's other ways. Um, we have made, I think, moral progress. Um, most humans in this room think that slavery, sexism, and racism are bad things. They're morally wrong. But, but when you get to a certain point of our, of our uh, ancestors, they wouldn't say they were morally wrong. They had the same brains as us, but they had different beliefs. Also, we are kind to those who are neither family nor friends. There's the institution of long-distance charity, of caring for people, say, who suffered in the disaster in Japan, exists now and didn't used to exist. So these are puzzles. And the question is, what happened? What made us nicer? Talking about babies is half the story. But the other half of the story has to be about what isn't in our heads, what has changed. And I think there's a lot of answers to that question. But I want to close this lecture by giving you one sort of case study of something which I do think has changed our moral views. And I think it's very interesting as a psychologist. And this is the imagination, and in particular, stories. So it's long been known that stories can change your moral perspective. And people often try to use stories to, to shape the morality of other people. In particular, parents often use stories to change the morality of their children. So for instance, if you are, are a liberal parent and you want to get your children to believe in liberal views about the sort of different families that can exist in a broad range of non-traditional families, you might give your children a book like Heather Has Two Mummies about a family that's different from the normal one, because you want your child to think that this is right. If you are a conservative parent, you may want to give your children a bit of a different book, like, help, mom, there are liberals under my bed. <laughs> and in general, there's a belief that these moralizing stories can shape how we think about the world. I'll tell you, I am very skeptical. I think, actually, kids are extremely smart. And there's a lot of evidence that kids can detect a mile away an attempt to persuade them to something, to tell them this is good and this is bad. And they're smart enough to sort of filter this out often. I think stories get their effect in a very different way. They get their effect as information sources. And I'll make it clear what I mean by this. But here's a sort of example. Um, Ayaan Hirsi Ali wrote a book where she described how she broke with a very strong form of religious fundamentalism. And she talked about what made her move away from religious fundamentalism. 
And part of the answer was stories. What she described as tales of freedom, adventure, of equality between girls and boys, trust and friendship. These stories were not great literature. They were not attempts to persuade. In fact, the particular book she was talking about were the Nancy Drew series. These weren't written as great moral fables, but they present a world that takes certain things as true, like the equality between boys and girls, freedom, equality, adventure. And that could change how you see the world. Stories in particular can work because they can exploit natural empathetic responses. What that means is they can make you feel. They can turn anonymous strangers into people who matter. Um, Joseph Stalin, one of the most terrible people on earth, uh, summarized this very nicely when he said, a single death is a tragedy, a million deaths is a statistic. And Mother Teresa, famously known for her charitable efforts, had a similar idea when she wrote, if I look at the mass, I will never act. If I look at the one, I will. Stories can make things personal. Um, you, could, you could be moved by seeing an individual. But a story can make you look at the world and see people in terms of individuals and can change your moral view. And this is studied by psychologists. So this is part of a, of a study by Paul Slovic and his colleagues. And what they did was, they did this for a real charity. And what they did was they gave people um, descriptions, statistical descriptions of suffering, like this. And then they saw how much they would give. And that's the answer. They would give, the average person would give, let's say, a little bit more than a dollar. But for the other group of people, they did something different. They showed a picture and a name and a person. And that had a huge effect. Now, all of this may be news to psychologists. It's not news to the people who, um, who construct charities. They don't throw numbers at you. They throw people at you. I'll give you an anecdote of mine for when I was a graduate student. I was arguing with a friend of mine, saying, we should give a lot more to charity than we give. Americans are too selfish. And finally, he got really fed up at me, with me, and said, how much do you give to charity? And I said, dude, I'm making a theoretical argument here. But, but I thought about it, and I didn't give very much. So I contacted um, what's now Plan USA and asked them for information about their charity. And a little while later, this was before the internet got so popular, I got a package from them. And I remember, open, remember opening up the package and expecting to see pamphlets full of numbers and data. But they did something extraordinarily clever. They sent me a child. They said, thank you for writing. We know you're not committed, but if you choose to commit, here is the child whose life you will save. And they had a photograph and a letter he wrote and a drawing of his house and where he lived in his village, and it was immensely persuasive. We, can be, we are wired up to be, to be incited to kindness by seeing people, not numbers, not statistics. Um, and this could have a, an effect on our morality more generally. The philosopher Martha Nussbaum talks about this in the context of Greek tragedies. So she says that although all of the future citizens who saw ancient tragedies were male, they were asked to have, the suffer, to have empathy with the suffering of many whose lot could never be theirs, such as Trojans and Persians and Africans, such as wives and daughters and mothers. Um, what stories can do is they could take the world from being an undifferentiated mass, move you to think about them as specific individuals, and have you think about them as friends and family. Um, I've talked about laboratory studies that this happens, but it most likely happens in the real world as well. Does anybody know who this is? Pardon me? Harriet Beecher Stowe. And Harriet Beecher Stowe uh, uh, was a novelist. And um, this was in America. And it was right before, it was during the time of slavery. And slavery according, slavery, according to many historians and many scholars, was not ended by, um, by theological arguments, by religious arguments, or legal arguments, or philosophical discussions, or moral arguments. It was largely ended through the force of the imagination. And in particular, uh, she was the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Now, there's probably many reasons why slavery came to an end. But Uncle Tom's Cabin is argued to play a huge role. Because what it did was, it, when you read it, 
it put you in the, it put your reader, who could be a wealthy white man, in the perspective of somebody who was suffering under slavery. And this empathetic force can change the world. There's a story of Abraham Lincoln um, meeting Harry Beecher Stowe for the first time. Perhaps a, a, not a real story, but it's, a, but it's a nice story nonetheless, of him meeting her. And his first words were, this was, this was as the Civil War was in full steam, saying, so you're the little lady who wrote that book that started this great war. And that's an example of how empathy can change the world. I'm interested in where does our niceness come from. I think part of the answer is it comes from the minds of babies. So part of the answer is that we're, we're born with it. But I think the rest of the answer comes from other capacities that have to be nurtured, like our uh, intelligence, our culture, and our imagination. Thank you.